Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A webcast. I'm Dave McCormick, VP of Product Management here at Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Sarah Mitchell, head of our documentation department. Today, Sarah is going to be giving a presentation on taking wireframes and turning them into actual Alpha Anywhere components. But she's also here to answer your question, and we've set a little extra time aside today for questions because we've had a lot recently. So please get your questions into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel so we can get to them a little bit later on in the hour. So let's get started. Hello, Sarah, are you there? I am here. Fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. And you should see a dialog box on your screen. And I can see your PowerPoint. Perfect. Awesome. <clears throat> Welcome. So yeah, uh, as Dave mentioned today, we're going to talk about wireframes. But if we talk about that, just a reminder, as we do every week, DevCon is coming up. Register now, save. Uh, but the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost. So definitely, if you haven't done so yet, uh, sign up so we can uh, have some good times in October. So we'll get right into it today. Um, I wanted to talk to everyone today about uh, taking your wireframes and getting a prototype. And and it's the goal of this is to get you in the mindset of thinking about uh, how your mockups map to controls in Alpha Anywhere. So for those of you who are not familiar with what a wireframe is, it's an application blueprint. It usually includes stuff like flow and layout and UI elements like buttons and uh, text boxes, uh, menu locations, and that kind of thing. And there are a bunch of different ways to create these. You can use an app, you can draw them on paper with pencil, uh, but the the main goal of a wireframe and what it should be is sort of a high level, black and white description of how your app uh, will work. You know, what are the key screens that people are going to use? How do they navigate through your application? And um, there's a lot of reasons to start with a wireframe uh, versus just jumping right in. Uh, one of those is to flesh out your core app. What do you really need? It, what's like the bare minimum you need for your app to to work and you know do what you want it to do? Uh, with wireframes, you can actually do things like uh, walk through the workflow and identify and resolve problems early that are more difficult to deal with after you've already started building an application. Um, you can test usability. <clears throat> you can actually put your wireframes in front of somebody and have, have them look at it and tell you if it makes logical sense. Uh, you can also use them to prioritize what is what is the thing you need to build first. Um, you may you may think that you know building your app that what you really need to have is like a really good way for customers to contact you through your app, but that might not be the thing you need to build first. You might need to build your login and get your login framework working and then have the the basics of sign up and that kind of thing. So with wireframes, it can help you identify what you need to start on. And with all of that combined, this can reduce development time. If you spend time up front just drawing on paper and working through what your app needs to do or what you want it to do, what, what problem it's going to solve and how it's going to do that, you save yourself a lot of time on the other end uh, where you don't have to go through a ton of iterations that are expensive to change because doing stuff in in, uh, in production, in development, actually building out those text boxes and connecting actions together is far more time consuming than uh, grabbing your eraser and moving a button or adding another text box. So it's it's a really good idea to wireframe your stuff before you do it. And this is something we do uh, internally. Uh, it's something we're doing right now as we prepare for DEF CON. We've got uh, Farmington's making a comeback this year, spoilers. And uh, we are wireframing out the the next phase of, of apps we want to add on to that whole, whole story. So we are wireframing right now. I'm actually using a notebook and uh, drawing with my eraser mostly. But just trying to figure out what it is that we want that app to include uh, for that presentation and to really make our training good. So that's why uh, it's a good practice. So I've put together a small mock-up today. 
uh, it's a reservation app for a restaurant. And there's going to be a few places where I've overloaded the term menu. So I'll try to make sure to explain that adequately. But uh, this is this is the whole mock-up of the app. Uh, it's got a login screen. This is the main, well, not a login screen. It has a main page. This is the first page people see when they launch their app. And they can look at the menu. They can, look, they can book a reservation. And they can see the locations of where this fictional restaurant McCormick's exists. Uh, up here, you see there's a logo box. But I haven't specified the exact logo because I don't need to at this stage. It's a mock-up. So this is where the logo is going to go. And these are the three buttons. Uh, when you click one of these buttons, for example, menu, it takes you to this menu page. And then here we've got this other uh, button looking thing. And this just shows you that if you click on that, then we show you a list of options to choose for navigation, go back to the home or some other place. Um, and then below here, we have the menu items for the restaurant, uh, the food that you would like to eat and how it's broken down. And just not real data, just a description of what would go there. And again, we have our, our logo and a header for this page. Over here on the side, there's just a few notes to keep in mind when developing this, like our menu will be updated monthly. And this menu icon is available on every single screen except for the main app page. And if we go back one slide, we'll see that wasn't there. So this is a basic mock-up of our menu page when you go there and some of the workflow that happens. So if you tap here, you would go there. And from there, if you select something, you would go to that location. Similarly, our location page just shows a map with a little marker on it where the restaurant is at. And if you tap on it, we'd like to show you some extra details as opposed to just listing it on the page here. Now, this is an example of maybe in a mobile app, it doesn't make any sense to do that because the location is static. Why would you ask somebody to interact with this? So perhaps as a reiteration on this wireframe with the client, which is me, um, I might choose instead of doing that, I would rather just show it on the page, keep it simple, maybe down here on the bottom. But we'll stick with this, this example here for now. Again, up here, we have our header with our logo in it and the title and that same menu from before, which is going to have this exact same behavior. And then finally, we have reservations, which is the real core of this app. The, the, the app is for making reservations. People use the app to reserve a table um, so they can come in and dine. So this, has got, this is where the bulk of our actions happen. So when you first view reservations, you see option to set, select a date a time that you would like to make your reservation and how many people are in your party. And once you fill this in and you click find a table, you see a list of available times for that date. And when you select time, you're then taken to the final page where it shows you the date that you've selected, the time you've selected, and the number of people that are in your party, and then some additional information so that you can book your table. And then off here on the side, some additional notes. Uh, our find table lists the available time slots for the date specified. And when you click it, you take it to uh, a <laughs> reserve <your> table, reserve table. <laughs> and then on the reserve table screen, uh, there's a note here that they would like to include like a, a three minute hold on the, the selected table. So like some sort of timer or countdown. It's not, it's not pictured here, uh, but this is something that's come out of the notes. Like we want to include this somewhere, maybe up here at the top. Um, maybe down at the bottom next to book table, but somewhere would like to include that information. And then finally, this book table button, there's no mock-up for it, but when you click on it, they'd like to display a confirmation with a button that would take them back to the home screen. And also that clicking that would email them reservation confirmation. So that is, that's the reservation wireframe in a nutshell, basically. So taking that wireframe and getting it to a prototype or some sort of more concrete mockup that you can work with is, is the big piece. It's the, it's, this, it's the gap that might exist for some people. So before you start doing any kind of design in Alpha where you need to decide what kind of component you're going to use. And because this is a mobile app, we are using the UX component. There's, it's the only one with, that, that will work on mobile. So first choice is our component. 
And then once we've picked a component, then we need to start thinking about, well, what types of controls and layout elements would fit into that mockup. So to review, a UX control has five classifications of controls in it. Uh, we have data controls, which are for capturing and displaying data, like your text boxes, your lists, your drop downs, your maps. Uh, panels represent screens. There are three types of panels in the product. We have panel cards, a panel navigator, which lets you navigate between panels, and a panel layout, which lets you decide how panels are laid out on screen, uh, side by side, top to bottom. We also have containers, which are control layouts. You put controls in containers. This include panel headers and footers, but also generic containers, windows, um, alignment containers, that kind of thing that help you aligning and group stuff together on the screen. And then the, finally, the other two classifications we have are other controls, which are used to display and collect information like data controls. The big one being there that they don't have values to get or set. So data control can have a value that you can get or set. Uh, other control types don't necessarily have a value you can get or set. Um, they are also used to trigger custom workflows. And when I say that, I mean buttons. You click a button, it triggers a workflow. Uh, but other, other controls include static text, static images, the placeholder control, uh, embedded components, the file drag and drop, so on and so forth. And then the final classification of controls we have are defined controls. And these are controls that either have a, a predefined workflow in them or some sort of pre-built interface. Uh, it's also, there's some debugging tools in there. Examples being the submit and reset. If you've got a UX that's data bound, the submit and reset you can use to send data back to the server, at which point you can then process it and save it in a database. But those buttons come pre-programmed with the logic that triggers that action. Uh, list buttons, like list detail view buttons, uh, can be added and found in defined controls. We have a bunch of predefined editor sets, which are used with the form view control, which we haven't we haven't really talked about that much in a very long while, but uh, we've built things like a, a keypad editor. Uh, it's all designed for you, and you just drop it in and go. And then a debugging tool, such as the SQL trace log. So thinking about the types of controls we have in Alpha Anywhere and looking at our mockup, which I wonder if I can just click on it here. Nope, I can't. So if we think about that mockup we had, this wireframe before, like, what what controls are really gonna map? Like, what can I think about? What can I use to mock this up? And I've I provided a list here of some of the things um, that make sense. So our reservation app screens. As you go through that reservation, each one of those is a panel. It's it's a full screen. It displays information as a, as a unit. So I would think of those as panels. The same with each one of our screens for like location, the menu, the home screen, those are all panels. Uh, the logo at the top that has the, the screen header that tells you where you're at and includes a little menu option, that's a panel header and it has an image in it and it has some static text. Our restaurant menu that lists all the items you can eat, uh, that's a list. The drop down menu, that you click up in the, the panel header with the little icons on it. That could be a button. Our location is a map control. Our available table times could be a number of things. It could be a button list. It could be a radio button rendered as a button list, or it could be a list. And then our, our table, uh, reserved table, where we collect all that information from the user, those are all data controls. They're text boxes, drop downs, date picker. So, Thinking about that and looking at the image, um, you can start to you can start to think about how you would build that in Alpha Anywhere. And I was, wanted to just do a little bit of that if I can get out of PowerPoint. And I've got. Let's start with let's start with this guy here just that main login screen. So if we come into Alpha Anywhere, we determined that for this app, we need a UX component. So the first thing I would do here, get all files, click new, make a web component, pick a UX. So this is our, this is our mobile app. We're gonna design this thing. And that very first screen that we had, and all of our screens would be panels. So 
uh, with panels, we would need two things. We would need to navigate them and we need the individual panels themselves. So that would that would say to you that you would need a panel navigator that would contain all the panels. And then you would need a panel card for each one of those screens. So let's start with uh, this one once or after. Start with the that main main app page, and we'll we'll rename this and call it main app main app panel. So we click back here. We see these were buttons. We also have our header up here. So let's put a header in here. You can actually right click and say panel header. No control bar. We're going to keep this pretty simple. So there's a panel header where we could put our logo and our, our um, any text that we want to include. And then in the body of at least of that first page, we had three buttons. So buttons are in other control. We can come down here, other controls, and add each one of those buttons. So we had uh, menu. Click OK. And I need to move that. Oh, no, I don't need to move that. That's in the panel but outside the panel header. So we have menu, reservations, and location. And it's a mobile app, so let's turn on mobile here. Let's, I'm not gonna deal with the panel header just yet, but I did wanna put that placeholder there. So very quickly here, we've already, Turn that on. We've already started. We've already mocked up that first screen that people are going to see when the app app opens. And it's menu reservations and locations. So um, <clears throat> so that that's that's how that would map here. Now, this isn't exactly like our wireframe. Like it's not centered and in the middle, but there are some other questions that come with wireframes uh, that can be answered with an intermediate step that a lot of people do do, uh, but um, I haven't done for today. And that would be to go through and create a, like a UI mockup where you you paint everything like in like Adobe or you go and you just mock everything up with HTML so that somebody uh, with design skills can tell you like these are blue, um, there's so many pixels high and wide and tell you what fonts to use. Uh, we'll stick with the base theme stuff for now. I would like to put a header in here. Uh, so let's do that. For the header, we could do an image. And let's see what images we've got access to. Image name. Don't know if we have alpha anywhere in here, our own logo. We don't. So let's let's add an image real quick. Go to my downloads here. Now I have a logo somewhere. Ah, here we go. I'll come back here. I'm going to quickly add new folder images in my wireframes web project. Open that up. And I'm just going to copy in here Elf Anywhere logo. And I think I can turn on preview. There we go. Oh, it doesn't want to show it. Well, I guess you'll have to trust me for a moment. That's the logo. But that's now here in my project. I can come back here to the static image and double clicking it and say image in web project or style and select from the web project folder. And that's our logo. And I'm not sure why it's doing that.
But there's our logo. It's very, very large. So I would like to nip that in the bud right now. Uh, let's see here. Let's just put a width of down here in the width section. Position and size. Let's just call it 120 pixels for now, which will be too small. But that should keep it within the within the preview window. So that's there's our logo up in the header. If we want the contents of this panel centered, I believe we can just check center panel contents. And it should put everything in the middle for us. And it does. And um, this you can resolve by using a container, which is in containers. We'll just put a none container around that. So there we go. We have menu, reservations, and location. So there's my main app panel. I would like to start designing out all those other panels or reservations or locations. So let's let's do menu. And then I think that'll be a good stopping point because I don't want to. The goal isn't necessarily to build the whole app today, just to get you thinking about um, the controls you can use. So we'll do uh, menu panel. And let's also add our reservations panel. And I'm going to duplicate this. There's a hotkey you can use, Control D, and Alpha Anywhere will duplicate everything that, that you've selected. And fun fact, it works in the view box and form view layouts. So if you're working in the in those layouts using the Genie, duplicate that again, put it down in our reservations panel. It's a it's a really quick way to add extra static text and stuff like that. So we have our menu panel, reservations panel. We want to navigate there when someone clicks on it. So let's edit this button and add that action. Go edit the JavaScript touch mouse click event. You can also just double click a button and it'll open up the click event for you because that's the most common thing people do with these. So we'll add our, our panel navigation. We'll find panel actions, click OK. And we'll say navigate to the menu panel. So we'll say set active panel, menu, save that. And then for reservations, we'll do the same thing. I'll double click that panel, multiple actions, set active panel, target panel name, reservations, And this is a side note, I'm going to leave this on carousel so I can click drag to get back because we don't have our, our menu uh, option that we could use to get back to those other locations. But let's just take a quick look at this. So if I click menu, I'm taken to menu. You're going to have to believe me because I didn't put any text on it. And then reservations takes us to reservations. And as we go back, notice we're going through two panels. So the the navigator is left to right layout. So you have, have to go through everything going back. But if we're going back, that would be our menu. And then we're back here. So And um, yeah, that's how we get started. I did want to show you um, button list. And radio buttons in particular as a button list. So let's add a radio button here. Let's call this guy um, time, time slots. So 
both the radio button and the checkbox control can be rendered as a button list. And what that means is that the choices will look like buttons when you when they're displayed as opposed to radio, um, like a circle that you would click on. And I find that this is a great way to provide sort of like that button click interface. And it's a little bit easier to work with than button lists because you still have access to choices, which can be a static, dynamic, or variable list. So if we went with, uh, we'll go with the static list here for now, just go 6, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m., and 9. Uh, but if you had uh, a database on the back end, you could have that hookup to be dynamic. So you would you could read the selected date out of your date control, which would be a text box with a date picker on it. Um, and so someone would pick that date, and then you would use that date and say, right, show me all available time slots for this date that are that are available. And then you would bring those dates back, uh, those times back down, and then that was what would populate your time slots here. So live preview this. We go look at reservations because I put that right here. There's our, our choices, six, seven, eight, and nine is off on the side here. You can have these rendered as a vertical list by changing the orientation. So we'll do that. Oh, but with that, um, add one more card here. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put just a, a static text control, which I'm using the add control here. But this here's some static text, or sorry, I don't want text, static text control. I want a label control. A label control is a data control, and so we can call this like selected time. OK. And let's make this a calculated field, because we'd like to show what the time slot was that was selected. So we'll come in here, and we'll just say um, selected time. Oh, not selected time. We want time slot. Insert field, time slots. There we go. And then in time slots, let's add an action on the click event. Say click. Let's do on select. And we'll have to use JavaScript here. But the uh, what we want to happen here is to navigate to the the last page. We've picked a time slot. So we want to show that like final page. So look like we're looking for a set panel. Is it panel set? Panel set active. Insert that. We'll get rid of this stuff here. And I should have renamed panel card for, but um, we will just use that. So this is the card we want to show when you click that. Click OK. So now we live preview. Reservations. Ah, I picked a date. Oh, the 8 o'clock is available. I've selected that. The time I selected is eight. So you can see how this stuff all starts to string together and how it can work. Um, labels, data controls are, um, they have a get and a set value. So you could, with the radio button, use that to populate your selected time for your final page when you, when you submit that. So that's um, sort of like just, just scratching the surface of what, um oh I've lost my what what uh what you can do moving from those wireframes into alpha anywhere and how to think about things. So we have button lists because you have a list of buttons, but maybe a radio button would be easier to work with. Or you could do a list when you select a value in that list, it would then set that selected time on your final submission page. So that's uh, the entire presentation I have today. Uh, we can certainly keep going through the design of that mock-up, um, but I'm hoping that uh, I've, I've communicated uh, to you how to sort of get started and, and how to think about taking your mock-ups and translating them into something more 
more tangible as a, a, a first pass prototype. Terrific. So uh, no questions so far on wireframes or mockups. We do have a couple other questions though that maybe we can get to. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with probably a, a shorter question. And someone says, seems to, pe the fa it says some people have latched onto encryption as the new gotta have feature. I agree, kind of is a gotta have feature. How much extra work is involved in having resting data encrypted? I don't know. All right. <laughs> this isn't well, something I, I, I have know, a lot of knowledge know, on. <laughs> well, I know that we went through this process with Transform. Transform, although we had the data was kept in a secure location, only we could access it except through certain lockdown API keys. We decided that it would be best to also keep the data encrypted uh, at rest as well. And that turned out to be really quite simple because the database that we were using, which I believe is either MariaDB or MySQL, I don't think it's SQL Server, um, has an option built into the database engine itself, which will let you keep that data encrypted at rest. And so what I would say is first take a look and see if the database will do it for you. Uh, we were afraid it was gonna be a big hassle, but it turned out that it was, I think we had to take the database down for I don't know, a very short period of time while we adjusted a setting and then brought it back up and uh, the data was encrypted and from the, there wasn't any really, any real performance uh, degradation at all that we were able to notice. So I'd say, take a look at it first from the database point of view. Um, Would that be encryption on the server? Encryption on the server, right? So that's the data that's at rest there on the server. Data right. at rest on a device is um, handled automatically for you if you're talking about a mobile device. I'm not sure how it's handled on a browser. So that if you've got further questions about it, go ahead and send send in an email to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S at alphasoftware.com. Um, quick question here about what wireframing tool do you use? <laughs> sure you had some that's... of it was in GIMP. Did you do it all in GIMP or did you use Balsamic? No, I didn't or... use GIMP. Um, I say that's hardcore GIMP is if you not did. a wireframing tool, but it's <laughs> it's a nice free um, cropping tool. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So I could cut things out and get them on the slides. No, I <laughs> put this together with Balsamic, but there Balsamic, are a yeah. lot of tools out there you can use. Um, Oh, I should have written this down. There was another one that I just looked at today. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, so balsamic, if you're not familiar with it, is spelled B-A-L-S-A-M-I-Q. And it is a wireframing tool that we use a lot here. There is a server-based version or cloud-based version, which is handy because it's low monthly payment and you could have multiple people work in uh, the same project. Uh, but there's also a uh, version that you can install on your own PC, and I think that's sort of a, a perpetual license if that's so you go. It's not terribly expensive, especially given the amount of time that it'll save you. So that would be my suggestion, but um, Sarah may have another one. It's staring me right in the face, and I can't yeah. see it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just looked at it today. Uh, it's one that I've seen other people in the community use, and it's it's nice because it, it has more... Um, crisp, crisp looking mock-up. So like, you can actually go from like this sort of cartoony uh, look uh, to something more um, like seemingly almost like you've, you've already built it, but you haven't, right. you've just been yeah. doing pictures. So, so in, the, in the world of wireframes, there's low fidelity and high fidelity wireframes. Correct. This is low fidelity and low fidelity is great because people don't get too hung up on colors and stuff like that. And, and and other elements, they just deal with functionality. And sometimes that's just a more efficient way when you're dealing with groups of people where you, you're not trying to get the visual feedback nailed down right away. You wanna start with what it's functionally supposed to do. And then you go to the high, high res wireframe. Right. Uh, I know what we've done is we've just used someone who's uh, who's good at Photoshop and, and has a good UI to, to put it together there. But as soon as you find that tool, we'll, uh, we'll let you know. Ah, uh, Figma, Figma is the other one. Figma, yeah. F-I-G-M-A. Yeah, let me go to their website here. And, well, it still has me logged in. <laughs> Let's right. see if I can get out of this. Uh, 
So yeah, Figma is another cool one. And the cool thing about Figma is you can actually make your, your wireframes interactive and like play them back. So if somebody clicks on something, it shows them the next wireframe. Oh, that Whereas is with the Salmic, I, I'm not 100% sure if that is in here. It might be. Yeah. Uh, full screen presentation, link hints close. I'm, I'm not really sure. User test. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is Basalmic. This is a presentation mode. But uh, Figma is another one. And they've got some really cool uh, pre-built stuff uh, that you can drag in there. And I was really impressed when I saw it. And it is, is free to start using it nice. when you sign up. And nicer looking at Balsamic, I would say. Oh, I mean, that's I feel like <laughs> that bar is pretty low. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, Basalmic is simple. It's something I've used a lot. It's something we use in the office. Uh, but Figma is another one that I would like to get to know better. Because I, I think a lot of UI uh, designers out there actually do use this uh, more than more than this. And it, it can do your everything. It can do your, yeah. your simple basic mockups, which you get with the Salmic, and then you can go and, to your and higher And pointing out, some, some of these tools blend sort of wireframing with uh, kind of like prototyping at the beginning. Mm -hmm. well. so yeah, yeah. Fine. Yeah. So yeah, you can do a little bit of that, that prototyping with, with Figma and just, just by drawing boxes and stuff. So. Cool. Um, couple other questions. All right, so here let's ask this. I'm going to ask a tough question because we have time if you have the ability yeah. to dive into it. Let's find out. Uh, so <laughs> we got actually this is one that came in by email this morning, and it has to do with uh, the form view. And what they would like to do is talk about is see if you could talk a little about about the form view, which has controls with a switch and a date time object in it. And when the value of the switch control is changed, it wants to capture the date and time of the event. So, like when they the the moment they want to capture the date time, the, the moment the the control the moment click? the switch is changed, exactly. Like, oh, huh. I just set it to off, or I've just set it to complete. Hmm. Let's make a new component, and it's the form view control that they're talking about. The form view control. Okay. So the, I believe the form view control is an other control. Mm -hmm. And for those of you unfamiliar with the form view control, the form view was built to provide a way to edit records, like in your list, and minimize the number of controls your app needs to include to do that. Yes. So, so one of the powers of the form view control is like you can add one text box control to your application and use that to edit everything. So you don't have to have separate text boxes for each thing. And in the case of getting like record, like you have like a, a list that has records in it that have a lot of information in it that you could set and change. Mm -hmm. uh, the form view is a, a good way to handle that. Um, I'm gonna set this up with some static JSON right now. And one of the reasons it's a good way, my understanding is that um, by having lots and lots of individual controls that uses up what are called watch events of the browser, which can end up making your app slow or even unusable if you have too many of them. Well, yeah, lots of controls with lots of watch events can do that. Also, if you just have like a ton of controls, it takes a long time for your app to download. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's that too, though, with mm -hmm. uh, Fiber becoming more prolific, it feels like that's less of a concern. Uh, so I'm just going to set this up with one record because like the list control, if this had multiple records, it would render the layout multiple times, mm -hmm. but it sounds like they have a switch. So let's, let's edit our data here to add a, I've got a switch Boolean and, got field. A, and then a date time field that they want to capture the date and time that the switch is done. Uh, Date, time. I'm just gonna say null for now. See if that likes that. Cool, valid. All right. And I don't know. All right. So deceased is unspecified. Display format. No. I see this. I'm remembering on the fly what this is. 
Did you, Your example did... is taking a turn for the macabre. Yeah. Let's go look in the documentation. <laughs> right. It's it isn't a bad idea to start asking questions about form views and view boxes right now because I have been in that documentation recently. Great. Switch. So it, are they have they embedded the switch in their form view layout or is it that they're using it as an editor? So let's add all these data controls in here. Oh, duh, data control. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> let's put first name city state in there. And then let's add our switch deceased. It's a two state. Um allow editing. Switch with. I'm just checking to see if it has any events here. And let's also add our date time. And this is a label. So that would get set when this changed. So let's just click OK real quick here and just to live preview this to make sure that I'm not, um, or to make sure that I've, I've set this up the way that they, it sounds like they, they want to set up. So, aha. So we need to go to the fields pane and define other settings for the field deceased. I, I presume this is so it knows what values it can have. Mm -hmm. Let's go there now. Fields, deceased, other settings. And has on off value, data type, logical. Uh, on value true. False. Okay, so that's set up. Alrighty. And allow editing. Interestingly enough, tapping it did not change it. If you have not defined an editor for this field, tapping the field will not let you edit it. OK. So we need to set up an editor set for this guy. OK, let's do this. <laughs> I'm going to start by putting this thing in a container. So you're around, and then after this, I'm going to add a container editor. Oh, I needed editor set, so let's change this to editor set. OK, and then define controls. Let's put a text box in there. And wait. Oh, and then go back to our form view and let's set up this guy with editor two, editor three. Editor three. So this is uh, what I was talking about. So I've added a text box editor over here, which is used to edit field values. And then those editors are assigned to individual fields in your field form view with this screen. So you pick your editor set and which editor within it you want to want to use. Okay. This should just let you click it. 
Um, and I may not be able to figure this out today. So here's our form view. If we click this guy, that's the editor for this. Last name, city, state. And then clicking this for whatever reason is not doing anything. And I'm wondering why. I'm not getting any errors here. So I may need to um, dig into this separately offline uh, okay. to get that set up. But I, I, am I on the right track here with what they've set up in their component? I think so. Why don't we come back to it next week? In the meantime, if you want to send in yeah. uh, the, an email, a follow-up email to guides at alphasoftware.com to make sure that we're trying to do what you actually want to do. Um, we can uh, complete the example next time we meet. Yeah, so there is, um on the documentation site, there is a switch control video and there's a component associated with that. So I was gonna pull that down just to see what what's different here. So let's open this up. Whoop. Copy that in here. And look at it. Ooh. I haven't seen that pop up in a while. <laughs> so here's our form view. Interesting. I wonder if it's because my data source was static. Because I didn't see those other options. Hmm. Well, in the example, the person did say that the data source is going to be a list. Yeah. So that's so that's clicking it, and they want to just capture when it gets clicked. Mm-hmm. So I think the way you would do that um, is you would come in here into the field template for the control, which just defines how it gets rendered. And I believe that's the value. Let's just try this. Let's try insert. Okay, let's go over here. Let's go to items. Let's add an item, say click. Like, okay, and when that gets clicked, we're just going to alert, click, that, and bar now equals new date. And then we'll go over here and say plus now dot to format. Uh, let's see, we want year, month, day, hour, zero minute. Going from memory here. And I don't think we need th three closing, closing parentheses. So we'll do that. New date creates a new date object and puts it in a variable. If you don't do this, uh, I cannot promise that you'll be able to do anything with the JavaScript date. Click OK, and then go back to our layout here. Edit the template, and just do insert item, clicked. And see if that does what we need to do. Save it, live preview. Yes, that's what we do. So I, I got my year wrong, but um, 
what you need to do if you want to set another value in your your form data is add an item to your switch and that can be inserted in your template which i just showed you uh, here and i put it in this first div which is going to be the whole thing so no it doesn't matter where they click on it and that will trigger some trigger your item and your items can have all sorts of events on them uh, beyond that, setting the, the value in another field, uh, I believe there are JavaScript functions to do that, and I think you would find them in documentation. Let's see here, we might even have a video on how to programmatically set a value. The setting the editor, but I will I'll put this in the chat window so you can check that out. So I think that gets them closer. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right. I've got one more. Yeah. So we'll take a look at it and then we'll also see if there's some follow up there. So I guess yeah. the, really the question was where, where do you put the, the JavaScript to do that? And I think you just showed that. Yeah. It goes in the item. It goes in the item. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, if there are follow up questions, go ahead and send them to guides at alpasoftware.com. Now, another question and an easier one, but a cool one. And the person was wondering, can you show how to set up an A5W page so that it can run a report? Let me see if I can find the exact wording on that. I'm sorry, I just had that question one moment ago. Where did it go? Disappeared in the list. Ah, can you show how to call a report from an A5W page using, uh, I guess it says using XBasic. I suppose you could also do it using a button. You'd have to use a button. You can't, you can't call XBasic without a button. Mm -hmm. um, or an event or something, yeah, but it, but uh, yeah. to use a, a, uh, a JavaScript I find it's easiest to use a JavaScript action, so maybe we could demonstrate that. Yeah, so like the the easiest way I, that you could do that is you would well let's make a report. Hold on, make sure I have data. I have data. Cool. All right, okay. let's make a report real quick. I'm just going to create a new report from a blank table report on Northwind. Next um where's products oops all products finish okay and then just very um quickly put some stuff in here uh product name um units in stock units on order there we go. And then if we preview this, it's going to look amazing. <laughs> I must name my report to print it, but I'll save as products. And then one of these is preview. That one. There we go. Look at that. Go. Amazing. All right. We don't know what units are, but we know they're, they're in stock. So, all right. So <laughs> we have our report. So I'm going to close this. Then I'm going to make a new UX component, select all files, new web component, UX, OK. And I'm going to add a button using add control, search for button. Oh, I should probably give it some text, change that text real quick. Run report, Doki, and then down here it's click event 
add a new action, open an email report letter or layout. I'm going to select my report that I just made. There should only be one. No filters. Um, and leave all of the defaults. I'm just going to keep all the system defaults here. I'm just going to pick that. Uh, display products report, save that. Then I'm going to save a page. I'm going to call this uh, products report. Oh, I got to save my component first. Products report. I am going to call the page the same thing. Save page, set the defaults. Save. Yes, I want to replace it. And then come over here to Web Projects Control Panel and live test that. <laughs> Products report locally. Clear out my live test folder. And there's my report. With that component, if you go and you look at the A5W page that got created, this guy here, look at the source. Here's the, the embed code for that component. So you could you could do something like this. You could make a UX that has that button and does it for you and just embed it on your A5W page. If you wanted to do a callback to an XBasic function to do it, um, it's more involved. Uh, callback. We do have a how-to article on how to do that. And it, it walks you through that. But um, basically what you would do is you would create a JavaScript function that you call that does the callback, which uh, could be a separate uh, page that you've created. So here's an example of what that E5W page would contain that contains the callback. And here is where you would do all of the, the code to run your report. And I believe the A5W or A5 report save as. Let's go look it up. So I'll post this in the chat. Let's look at report. Save as. There we go. The A5W report save as is the function you want to use in a web project to run your report. And this has a lot of examples in it on how to do that uh, with That's strictly right. X basic. So mm -hmm. yeah. But if it was me doing this, I would I would try to go to the UX component route because mm -hmm. It, all that code's written for you, so you just need to worry about where you're embedding, embedding it. And this doesn't doesn't need to take up the entire page. It can just take up the space that contains that button. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it looks like they were having some issues specifically with A5W report save as function. In which case, go ahead and send in an email to guides. We'll See if we can get that straightened out for you. Yeah, if you have a problem with that function, we need a we need a, a test case. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um. Let's see if there's anything else here. That is. Uh. That looks like it. Oh, and look at this. We're also out of time. Uh. If you do have <laughs> future questions, thanks very much, Sarah, for presenting today. Thank you, everyone, for attending and asking questions. If there are further questions, of course, guides at alphasoftware.com is where you will send it. Until then, uh, take care, stay well. Hope to see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.